T.S. Eliot wrote, between the idea and the reality lies the shadow. In other words, ideas can seem great on paper, but sometimes the reality of them is something all together different. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently living in the shadows of globalist ideologues, bad ideas in Hollywood and elementary schools, eventually in government policy until now its residence is in things like say the World Economic Forum. So I leave the World Economic Forum and I go to these places and I can see how globalism is playing out in the lives of people all over the world coming back from what I just saw. And here's the big bomb. The Biden administration is running a massive human trafficking op, perhaps the biggest the world has ever seen. Welcome in to another episode of Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry, Alex, Taunton, and today, ladies and gentlemen, I really don't even know where to begin. So I'm going to ask you on the front end for your patience. I'm sitting here. I've got Montezuma's Revenge, or I picked up some kind of um, jungle disease or something while I was in Central and uh, South America. I just got back last night. I haven't slept for the last few days and I am utterly exhausted, but I was really looking forward to getting back in to the studio um, to get some thoughts out. And that's because my heart and my mind, they are so full of the experiences of the things that I have seen that I've been, been engaging in for the last several weeks. And, um, and that really is where I want to start today. I mean, we're talking about on this episode, we're talking about immigration, we're talking about uh, open borders, we're talking about illegal aliens, migrants, whatever it is that you want to call them. And there's just there's just so much about this that I, I want to say, but I want to start by giving you a little bit of background on my experience with this topic and why, why it's drawn um, my attention. Financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around six rate cuts by the Fed this year. Then the data came out higher than expected. Friends, this isn't going away, not anytime soon. It simply can't. The US is $34 trillion in the hole, and yet we keep printing money, which pushes the prices you pay every day even higher. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. Diversify a portion of your savings into Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation and Birch Gold Group makes it really easy for you to own. They'll help you to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold. And you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Text IDEAS to 9898. 98 and get your free info kit on gold then talk to a precious metal specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold text ideas to 989898 for the whole of my career really um, i have been tracking what i call philosophical atheism and uh, what i mean by that is I make a distinction between that and what I call cultural atheism. Philosophical atheism is, in my defining of it, it's a settled position of atheism. It's a worldview of atheism. It is often expressed in the academic world. It's aggressive. It's evangelical. I mean, they're uh, philosophical atheists are the kind of people that their atheism, it defines them. And um, they seek to push it. They seek to, to make converts to their world view. They seek to create policies that promote that worldview versus those that I refer to as cultural atheists. And by cultural atheists, I mean the sort of people who maybe haven't given the question of God's existence 
a great deal of thought. Um, but when you ask them, um, they maybe will tell you, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think I really believe that there's a God. I had a couple of professors who were like that, uh, guys who had an enormous impact on my own thinking, my own uh, career, uh, one by the name of M.R.D. Foote, Michael Foote, who is a very famous historian and spy, um, Oxford historian, something of a mentor um, to me. And, you know, he's a guy that I don't think would have had much respect for, interest in guys like, let's say, Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett or those kind of guys, philosophical atheists. But I think if you would have asked Michael if he believed in God, I think he would have said, eh, no. I mean, I don't know that that was true at the end of his life. I, I think um, there's reason to believe otherwise. But but that, that's what I mean. That's what I'm talking about when I, say, when I say philosophical atheism versus cultural atheism. Somebody who's just kind of absorbed a sort of a godless worldview from their culture without really thinking about it. So I've been following, tracking philosophical atheism like a hunter tracks wild game, big game. That's what, what I've been tracking. I've been following it um, from... First, the academic level, high academic level, the Ivy League, Oxford, Cambridge, elsewhere. And then it's trickled down effect into the popular culture where you see it expressed in, uh, in Hollywood. You see it expressed in elementary schools. You see it expressed in um, eventually in government policy until now its residents, uh, we find, at least its policy wing, is in things like, say, the World Economic Forum. And um, so I've been paying close attention to that issue and where it's going. And Open Borders is part of this. If you've watched previous episodes where I've discussed George Soros and the ideas that are driving his open society foundation, um, then you will know that, that I see that. I see the open society. I see George Soros. I see Bill Gates as all individuals who are driven by philosophical atheism. And hence the reason, if you're looking for a common thread throughout the whole of my career, and it isn't to say that I don't address other issues. We've addressed Islam in a very big way, and they're not atheists, and along with many other issues. But in the Western world right now, it is philosophical atheism that is dominating in every aspect of our society. And as I've also said, it's, it's what leads to, to uh, a Romans 1, Romans 1, 18 through 32, where the Apostle Paul says that they suppress belief in God. And having suppressed belief in God, Paul goes on to argue that it's basically just anything that goes because I've been thinking lately that there's no such thing as moral reasoning. You will hear that every now and then as if to suggest that there's reasoning that isn't moral. All reasoning Real reason is based in your worldview. It is based in your mor morality. And apart from morality, what we are left with is unreason. We are left with only the ir irrational, the illogical. It's how we get to a place where we are right now. And this is Paul's argument in Romans 1, 18 through 32, where he basically there says that once you've chucked belief in God, you begin to say things like up is down and down is up, that men can be women and women can be men, and on and on and on. You begin to deny the reality of the world that you are seeing. So how does this relate to borders? Well, it relates to borders <laughs> in, in a variety of ways, and uh, certainly one of which is Karl Popper, the, the Austrian philosopher, his Open Society and Its Enemies, the two-volume work that I would suggest. I don't know if I have it sitting right here or you know, somewhere nearby, but a two-volume work that I would suggest that you, you maybe consider reading. But it's, 
is being driven by fundamentally a view that ideas matter more than people. And in September of 2017, I published a piece in Town Hall, my first piece, I think. I might have written one in 2016 as well, but I'm not sure. But in September of 2017, I published a piece in Town Hall titled Why Democrats Want No Walls, No Borders uh, as well, but Why Democrats Want No Walls and Why We Must Build Them. And in it, I said this. Now, I'm not going to read the entire article. I'm just going to read you a portion of it. Again, this is September of 2017, in which I wrote this. In July, then-presidential hopeful Elizabeth Warren laid out her platform on border security. She essentially called for the elimination of borders. Even far-left Mother Jones, Mother Jones is a a very leftist publication, expressed alarm over this proposed policy. In an article titled, Are Democrats Now the Party of Open Borders?, Kevin Drum wrote, Warren's border policy is a curious plan. As near as I can tell, it recommends no action to improve border law enforcement in any way. There's nothing about either a wall or a virtual wall. There's nothing about E-Verify. There's nothing about smarter or more efficient enforcement. No one will ever be deported, except presumably for serious felons, though Warren doesn't even say that explicitly. Expressing frustration over this phenomenon, New York Congressman Peter King said, I wish the Democrats would put aside political correctness and realize there is nothing racist or bigoted about having a border wall. You have these good intentions. We're an open society. People come across the border. Well, listen, if you saw the dead bodies in my district as a result of people coming across the border freely, you'd see the consequences of this. Now, Peter King was referring to a terrorist attack in which Muslims had killed people in his own district, something that has become quite common throughout the Western world, and it's becoming more common in the United States. It typically was confined to Western Europe, where their borders have been open to Muslims much longer than our borders have been, but now that is starting to change. But did Democrats listen? Did they decide, oh gosh, we probably shouldn't do this. Maybe we should consider closing the borders. No, of course they didn't. As you as you know, they doubled down on their open borders policy. Now, why is that? Well, as I said, I have explained in a previous podcast or two that this is all being driven by the philosophy of Karl Popper, who believed that only by throwing the borders wide open and people groups together could you achieve a global, universal, moral ethic. And again, Popper was a guy, who he didn't believe in God. He didn't, he didn't believe in an absolute universal truth. In fact, he believed that there must be a permanent uncertainty about the truth. That we couldn't know, we really couldn't access real, absolute truth nothing concrete. Therefore, we needed to be suspicious of anyone who claimed to have the truth. Now, again, I, I don't want to go into to, um, to Popper in any depth here because I have done that elsewhere. But for those of you who might be listening for the first time, I will just offer this little bit of background. There's much that if you were to read Karl Popper, you would agree with. I don't equate him with George Soros you know, completely, even though Soros was a student of Karl Popper at the London School of Economics and took um, from Popper's uh, seminal work, The Open Society and Its Enemies, he took the title of those works for the title of his own foundation, The Open Society. And that's what Peter King is here referring to. King himself is essentially acknowledging that he knows that the open border uh, uh, policy is being driven by George Soros, and before him, behind him, Karl Popper. But Popper was responding somewhat understandably to what he had seen in his own native Austria. He had watched, he had, he had been in Vienna when the, the Nazis came, you know, goose-stepping you know, through his, his beloved um, city and his beloved country. And what he saw in fascism 
were people who claimed they had the absolute truth. And then in the post-war world, he saw the same thing in the Soviet Union. They claimed to have the absolute truth in Marxism. And um, both fascism and Marxism claim to be scientific. I mean, this is actually interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's not a new phenomenon that those who would seek to be our overlords always make false claims to scientific absolutism, to scientific certainty. They claim that they have it, that they know that you cannot argue with them because you must follow the science. I mean, this is what we heard on, on absolutely everything to what we're seeing taking place in our culture. I mean, I think it was Justice Alito who said in a, um, he didn't say this in a ruling, he said this in a talk he'd given somewhere, but the left's design, the left's goal is to try to move society away from democracy and towards experts, hand-chosen experts, not real ones. I mean, if there's any word that has taken more of a beating in recent years, it would have to be the word expert, isn't it? I mean, we hear all the time, headlines say, experts say, I mean, that's what fact-checking is, is it's a claim to being an expert. I have the expertise to fact-check you, to declare that you are wrong. And we see how that goes. I mean, we now have media, you know, claiming that Trump is calling for a bloodbath. I mean, this is complete nonsense. But Popper seeing this claim to scientific truth, to absolute truth, decided that the only way civilizations are going to survive is if, A, we adopt a policy of tolerance towards one another as societies and as it pertains to um, uncertainty, as it pertains to truth, and that we eliminate societies until all we are left with is a society singular, not plural. So we throw everyone together. That's what we do. It's all a mad social experiment, but they are absolutely committed to it. Now, an ideologue, as I say, or an ideologue, is by definition someone for whom ideas, their own ideas specifically, matter more than people. Karl Popper, for instance, was an ideologue. 100% an ideologue, but so too is George Soros and Barack Obama and Bill Gates and the whole membership of the World Economic Forum and the European Union. Listen, for instance, this is also drawn from the same article that I wrote in 2017, and I wrote another version of it in 2019. So this is kind of a mix of both of those articles. But listen to the words of Judy Dempsey a senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, a think tank providing policy recommendations to the European Union following the November 15th Paris attacks in which Muslim suicide bombers and gunmen killed 130 people and injured 368 others. In a piece titled, After the Paris Attacks, The Open Society and Its Enemies, she says this, that Europe had reached a defining moment. And listen, to, listen carefully to what she says here. At stake is how to strike a balance between the open society and the defense of citizens. It will require steady nerves from all European governments not to bow to populist, Euroskeptic, and anti-Muslim movements that wish to batten down the hatches. Now, Note the way she uses the word populist. I've been saying this for years. In the mouths of globalists, of people on the left, populism is, that's the hairy unwashed masses. Those are fascists. Those are Nazis. The reality is that populism is just, it's just the common people. William Wallace was a populist. That was a populist movement. The American revolution at some level was a populist movement. But here, populism, there's disdain because the, the op, its opposite is elitism. And this woman, uh, Miss Dempsey, she is 
an elitist to the max. And she is saying European governments should not bow to populist Euroskeptic. Euroskeptic was a term to be used for those people who are not in favor of the European Union and anti-Muslim movements. Now, my guess is that Miss Dempsey herself doesn't live in the kind of places where these kinds of terrorist attacks are taking place, or she might have a very different view of all of this. But again, as we've discussed before, <laughs> when you're insulated from the things that other people are suffering in the world, it's easy for you to take these kinds of uh, um, you know, high-minded positions. And that's what she's doing here. She, she is essentially urging people she is urging European leaders to ignore the howls of their citizens who are skeptical of globalism, alarmed by mass Muslim resettlement within their own countries and a corresponding rise in terrorism and rape and kidnapping and petty crime and want their borders secured and regulated by sensible immigration policy. She's saying, ignore all that. Ignore them. Don't pay attention to them. And have you noticed how universally Western leaders are in lockstep on ignoring their constituents? Joe Biden isn't listening to anything the American people want. He doesn't care. Justin Trudeau does not care. Sunak doesn't care. Macron doesn't care. None of these people do. And they're all taking they're marching orders from the same source. These are all individuals who belong to the WEF. So when you're you know, seeing me in the last seven weeks, and there's been a few people you know, who've gone on the YouTube page or maybe on my Twitter and see this maybe as me bragging you know, or something like this. I mean, whatever. You can say that if, if you want to say that in mentioning the places where I've been in recent weeks. That is my purpose in seeing that. And no uh, sensible person would think that. I'm simply pointing out to you that I'm speaking. I'm not just simply speaking from my living room where I'm wearing my slippers and I haven't walked out of the room. I'm not just simply reading what other people are saying and then deciding which bits that I agree with and then offering you, you know, a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, an extemporized opinion. I'm going to these places. And I'm, I'm trying to do this thoughtfully. I want to do this thoughtfully. I don't, listen, I don't pretend to have all the answers. Far from it. Rather, I feel very passionately that what is happening, not just in my country, which I love. The America that I'm fighting for is the America that is embodied in the Declaration of, of Independence and in our Constitution. America has been great because she has been good. When she ceases to be good, she ceases to be great. And right now, she is not good and therefore not great. And it's because we're governed by criminals. I want my tombstone to read, he gave all he had. He left it all on the field. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid playing football. I remember one of my coaches putting me in and he said, son, we're losing. Get in there and hit somebody. Get in there and hit somebody. He was just saying, look, we, we need a spark. We, we need a spark. Get in there and jack somebody up. That was Isaiah. Isaiah was that guy when he said, here I am, Lord, send me. That's what I want to be. I want to be that guy. Lord, if there's some place where you need someone and someone else isn't willing to go, I'll go. I'll go. I'm willing to do that. But it isn't just in my country. It's in the whole Western world. And so to try to understand this better, I told you I'm feeling very passionate today because, gosh, have I seen a lot. And, again, I'm very tired. I've been on the road for the last – I've been in, I, I, what, eight countries, seven countries in the last seven weeks. I was home for 10 days in between. And – um and I'm, I'm still trying to process a lot. So again, maybe this doesn't come out in the most, organized, the most organized way. And it will when we begin to put these thoughts with images because we'll produce a documentary that deals with this. But the reason I'm going to the World Economic Forum and from the World Economic Forum to 
you know, to Italy and to the UK and to, uh, and to Egypt, as I did earlier this year, is because the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at the elites, the people who are calling the shots, the guys who are on top of the pile. And then I want to go to the world and I want to see how it's playing out for ordinary people. Because I don't believe that, that the people at the top who arrive at the World Economic Forum in their private jets who can't even bother to drive from the airport at Davos into Davos but have to take helicopters to then come and lecture us about our carbon footprint, I don't believe John Kerry has any idea what life is like for real people. I just don't think he knows that. I don't think he cares. I don't think Klaus Schwab cares. I don't think Bill Gates cares. I don't care. I don't think that any of these shitty people care about you. They don't care about me. They don't care about human beings because all they believe in are their ideas. And quoting this woman right here, Judy Dempsey, this is the classic thinking of an ideologue, of an ideologue, an idiot. People don't matter as much as our utopian vision does. And we only see human beings as the raw materials, the brick and mortar for building our utopian vision. Screw all of you because we're better than you. That's their attitude. So I leave the World Economic Forum and I go to these places and I can see how globalism is playing out in the lives of people all over the world. And then I come home and I was home only briefly to see the wife and kids and the, the dog to catch my breath briefly. And I thought, I really want to go once again south of the border to Central and South America to get a close look at what's happening down there. And I don't really want to go because I was just, I was just feeling overwrought. But I thought I need to. I need to go do this. And I'm so glad that I did. Tired that I am. I'm so glad that I did because of the insights that it gave to me. Um, again, <laughs> These are people, you know, I think it was Lady Astor in, and I don't think Stalin invented this phrase, but I think it was Lady Astor on a tour of Russia in the 1930s when people were being starved to death deliberately by Stalin's government. They were selling the grain of Ukraine and of Russia overseas because they needed the hard currency. They wanted the money, but they knew that in doing it, they were going to starve their own citizens. So there was a mass famine, millions died. We have no idea how many died. And Lady asked, Lady Astor asked Stalin, when are you going to stop killing people? And he said, when it's no longer necessary. Stalin, who said, and again, I don't think he invented this phrase, to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. And that's the globalist attitude. That's WEF thinking. That is the thinking of an ideologue. To make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. And ladies and gentlemen, we're the eggs. They're not the eggs. Bill Gates is saying we need to reduce the global population. Has Bill Gates offered to step into a gas chamber and euthanize himself? I don't think so. Have all of these people who are calling for the reduction, Dennis Meadows, the reduction of the global population by 6 billion people? And that's, that actually is conservative. He, he says it'd be better if it were 7 billion people. Are these people offering to kill themselves? To lead by example? No, they are not. They don't mean them. They mean you. They mean me. And part of what I want to appeal to, to Democrats, to people on the left, is you've been so deceived, so clouded emotionally, you've... You, you, you have that Trump derangement thing going on, or maybe you don't like your, your conservative neighbors, or you think that all conservative people are rednecks, or whatever it is. You've been, you've been so deceived by that that you can't see the truth. You have now <laughs> allowed yourself to be co-opted in to a worldview, to policies that are about the annihilation of the unborn the annihilation of um, 
white people. I mean, the whole white supremacy thing that's going on here, the discriminatory practices that we are now seeing institutionalized, that you are seeing extraordinary evil being committed in a country that's supposed to be a free country. That's not the America that I grew up in. I grew up in an America where I, I've had loads of friends with whom I have ideological disagreement, but I could have discourse and we could still smoke a cigar afterwards and enjoy each other's company. Not anymore. That's not where we are as a society anymore. We are rapidly looking like Germany of the 1930s, where we are going to end up with, with um, a segment of the population that will no longer be allowed to be employed to participate into society that will be discriminated against, that will be dehumanized, that will what? Eventually be deported? Put into concentration? I mean, is this where we're headed? It certainly looks that way because once you have been convinced that it is a moral good to kill your own offspring, you'll believe anything. Once they force you to swallow the pill that up is down and down is up, you will believe anything. And they know that. You will just go along with it. Think, people. Think for yourself. And again, that's part of the reason why that I decided that I wanted to head south of the border. But this is where we find ourselves. You know, it may very well be that the common people in the West, very few of them probably have read Karl Popper or know who Karl Popper is, but they know very well what the attitude of their politicians is concerning open borders. Watch this brilliant little video. This is from just a couple of days ago. St. Patrick's Day parade in Ireland. Watch this. This is absolute genius. Now, what you're seeing in that video is this is, a, this is a, a brilliant protest against the EU, against the open borders policy of the EU, but of the West in general, of their own politicians who are following Judy Dempsey's advice and ignoring what the people want. Elected leaders being told to ignore their own constituents. And as I've said elsewhere, the only reason you would ignore your constituents is if, A, you're retiring, you're on your, you know, presidents would often say that it's in their second term that they do what they really want because they're not seeking re-election. So you would only ignore them as if, A, you knew you weren't seeking re-election or couldn't, or you're retiring, or if you knew the fix was in. You knew that it didn't matter what you did because you were still going to be in office. You're still going to be elected because you knew the fix was in. And so these are people who are showing this is what, what some of these illegals are doing in Ireland, smashing up their cars. They have a hapless policeman chasing them around very ineffectively, not getting anything done. No one is being punished for what is happening. That's genius. T.S. Eliot wrote, Between the Idea and the Reality, lies the shadow between the idea and the reality lies the shadow it's a brilliant thought in other words ideas can seem great on paper in the classroom on the chalkboard but sometimes the reality of them is something all together different Take socialism, for example. To some people, I'm, I have never been one of them. But to some people, socialism looks really good on paper. They read Marx and they find it very compelling. They think socialism could work. And it should work. But the reality of socialism is something altogether different. It never works. It can't work. 
It's contrary to human nature. It's contrary to common sense. It's contrary to the laws of God. But bad ideas are like Antonio Brown's NFL career. There's always a coach who is sure, who's arrogant enough to believe that he can fix him. You know, if you ever, you ever watch, and this is true of, of him and, uh, you know, dozens of others of NFL players, uh, in not just in the NFL, but elsewhere, but they see a guy who's so talented and he, he gets, he, he, he loses a job with one team or he's dysfunctional with one team or another, and they're sure they're going to be the guy who's going to be able to fix him only to discover like all the other coaches before them that they couldn't. They ignored previous history. And that's the way bad ideas are. They seem to have an, uh, 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 an indefinite, eternal shelf life because there's somebody who's going to come along and say, I can make it work. I can make it work. And socialism is like that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are currently living in the shadows of globalist ideologues, bad ideas. After the publication of the aforementioned 2017 column explaining the philosophy behind that was driving globalist Democrats' call for open borders, I was honored to receive a call from then Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, who wanted to discuss it. And after that conversation, I felt very inspired by the fact that there were a few good men still in government, trying to combat this growing evil. They were trying to combat it. I decided, so I decided to investigate the issue further. And having thoroughly researched the idea behind open borders, I would now focus on the reality of open borders. You see, so I'm, I'm going from the idea to the reality. I'm going from the idea through the shadows to the reality. What did the reality look like? Did it look like anything like Popper's or Soros's vision? Uh, or were those just guys who just, you know, they're they're so insulated from the reality in their classrooms or, you know, or or in their estates um, that they don't really know the reality. So I decided I would I would investigate the human cost of this bad idea. So in 2019, I began uh, what has continued into this day, my investigations into what is going on south of the border, because it seemed to me at that time, now it's become somewhat popular. There are a variety of people who are, who are doing this, going into the Daring Gap and even through it. Um, but when I started this, no one at the time seemed to be asking the question, what exactly is going on south of the border? I mean, we are seeing millions of people coming into the United States, crossing our border. I mean, if this was your, let's just say this was your, um, your lawn and wild animals, you know, were stampeding across your lawn, you would begin to ask, what is going on over there? What is going on in that direction that is driving them in this direction? Because we're not seeing a stampede from Texas into Mexico and Central America and South America. We're seeing it from Central, South America, Central America into the United States and other parts of the world. So what is going on? Well, in many cases, these are people who are trying to escape socialist shitholes. I mean, that's just what it comes down to. They're trying to escape. They're trying to escape uh, countries that have been absolutely cratered by the bad idea of socialism, which is, as I have said, Atheism masquerading as political philosophy. I've been tracking this worldview for a very long time, and that's exactly what it is. It's just a political expression of atheism. There's nothing Christian about socialism. If you're somebody who believes that, you have no idea what Christianity is, or you don't know what socialism is, or you don't know what either of them is. I mean, I don't want to... Maybe that's a maybe that's a podcast in and of itself, but... I can dispense with this question very easily. In one sentence, the Bible annihilates any notion that socialism has any validity whatsoever. Thou shalt not steal in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments. Because in, in that one line, 
Scripture is affirming private property. And socialism's central tenet is that there is no central, there is no uh, private property. There isn't any. Furthermore, that giving is volitional. It's not required by the state. It's something that you choose to do. Even God didn't compel, uh, compel the people of Israel to give. He commanded them to do so, but he didn't confiscate it. He gave them the choice, just as he does now, he gives you the choice to give. You can choose not to, in which you are in violation of God's law, but he doesn't compel you to do it. You have a choice as it relates to these things. So in many cases, these are people, maybe most, these are people who are escaping countries that have been destroyed by socialism. Venezuela, for example. Colombia is now going to go in that direction. Chile is going to go in that direction. Uh, Honduras, uh, Peru, Guatemala, they're all going to head in this direction. And these are people who are seeking freedom in many instances. I'm not talking about cartels. I'm not talking about those individuals who are being sent by their own governments for nefarious reasons. But again, there are things that the United States could have done to try to improve conditions in those countries. But instead, we're over in Ukraine. And what are we doing in Ukraine? Well, we toppled a regime there. I freely elected one, presumably, in 2014. And now we're laundering lots of money there. For what reason? I believe, in part, to fund these kinds of globalist projects. And I'm going to get into more details on that in what is happening in this part of the world. But I just want to drive home the point that I've spent a lot of time researching the ideas, but now I've immersed myself on and off for five years in the reality. And the reality of what I see that's happening south of the border is it's kind of stuff that it keeps you awake at night. I'm going to say this, and, and some of you will dismiss it as nonsense, but that's okay um, because I believe in God and <laughs> some of you don't. When I became ill a couple of nights ago, and I was violently ill, and it was just before I was about to board my flight from Mexico City to Miami, that night I was up vomiting much of the night. My wife who was with me in Mexico City, had eaten the exact same meal that I'd had. It's, you know, I joke that it's Montezuma's revenge, but it's not Montezuma's revenge. And nobody is more careful than I am when it comes to eating when I travel abroad. I, I am, uh, I'm an adventuresome person, but not when it comes to eating. I'm, I'm really quite boring when it comes to eating. I, there are loads. I'm a very picky eater. There are a lot of things I just won't begin to touch. And um, I drink bottled water. When I'm abroad, I'm careful with my food choices because there's no easier way to end a trip or a mission that you are on than to get sick because you've eaten the wrong thing or some. Yeah, I don't ever eat street food. I don't care what the locals say. Uh, Americans, our constitution is just not up to eating what say somebody somebody in uh, India or Mexico, uh, rural Mexico uh, in particular, what they're up to eating. They might eat the empanadas you know, that they, you buy on the street. Probably not wise for you. Doesn't mean that you can't get away with it, but you need to be pretty careful when it comes to that sort of thing because your body just isn't used to it. So Lori had had the same thing that I'd had. She didn't get sick. And accompanying my vomiting were these kind of nightmarish thoughts of all the things that I'd been seeing. I'd been... I've been in places where children are being trafficked, where sex and drugs are all readily available, where if you probably wanted to have sex with a child, you could probably pay for it, and that happens, where the cartels are extremely active, where violence is all around you, where everyone's being extorted and blackmailed, and I'm sitting and listening to stories of people watching members of their 
their party as they're going through the Darien Gap. And I go to the Darien Gap on both the, uh, the Colombian and the Panamanian sides. And I'm talking to people who have been raped and a group of people had watched someone in their own party being eaten by a jaguar. There's an aspect to this work that's wonderful. I love what I do for a living. I really do. Some of you are kind enough to um, you know, say that my, my lifestyle and my work and what I do is like that of Indiana Jones or James Bond. That, that sounds really wonderful. Um, and I wouldn't want to do anything else. I'm called to do this. I'm called to do what I do. And please don't hear me as saying uh, you know, that I'm some kind of victim because I'm most definitely not. I have a wonderful life and there are, are aspects to it that are really glamorous and wonderful that I can enjoy a beautiful restaurant. I can enjoy a, a dinner cruise down the, um, the, the Seine or um, the Thames or the Tiber. But there's another aspect of it that takes you into the darkest aspects of human nature. And there are spiritual, there's a spiritual consequence to that. When I was um, when I was 19, I became involved in a prison ministry called Kairos, and twice I went for four days, I believe it was, um, each time, into maximum security prisons to minister to men who were, um, some cases, you know, we're talking a murderer's rapist. I remember one guy had had uh, raped a 14 year old girl and chopped her body up, and you're you're trying not to know these things as you're sharing the gospel with them. You're trying to you're trying to offer them the hope of Jesus Christ. And it was the first time in my life that I felt the physical presence of evil. It was like the physical presence of evil. You entered into that space when you went through those massive you know, electronically controlled doors. And we're finally in the compound with all these prisoners, homosexuality rampant, you name it. It's all going on there. First time I was there, a guy was murdered, perforated with a fork, I think. Uh, somebody had taken a fork and sharpened it on the sidewalk and just gutted him with it. And a uh, second time... A uh, guy hung himself. So, I mean, you really feel the evil. Since then, I've encountered it so many times all over the world. I've seen it in the persecution of Christians in Africa. I've seen it in the evil of things I've encountered in Asia and in South America. And this is probably my 10th trip to South America, so I'm, I'm hardly new to that continent. But if there's anything to be encouraged about, I guess it's this. I, I guess that it's encouraging to know that I'm not yet desensitized to human suffering. Because you can be. You can get to a place where, where you are insensitive to it and you don't care. Maybe there's enough space between each time that I engage with it that I still feel it. I feel it deeply. And so I might come back to a nice hotel and order a pina colada and sit by the pool, but my head is still full of the images and my heart is still full of the feeling, the dirtiness, the corruption, the evil that you're encountering. And I said this on Twitter, but it's worth saying this here. I accept that the words of Jeremiah 17.9 are true. Absolutely true. And if you're not familiar with the words of that verse, they say this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I accept that that's true for me. I accept that I am fallen. I accept that I'm sinful. I can look into my own heart and know my own evil intentions. I'm aware of the fact that I'm a man with feet of clay. I know this. Um, and if you don't know this about yourself, then you're not being honest with yourself. You're, 
you're being like all of us when we look at ourselves in a photograph and say, ah, you know, photos add 10 pounds. That isn't really what I look like. <laughs> we all lie to ourselves in little ways, but we also lie to ourselves in big ways by saying that, oh, you know, I'm not such a bad guy. I may not be as good as some, but I'm better than most. So I accept that it is true, biblically true, thus absolutely true, that humanity as a whole, we are fallen and we are by nature, we have a bent towards evil. Jesus, in talking to the disciples on one occasion, refers to them as evil. <laughs> he says, if you who are evil wouldn't give you know, your, your son who asked for you a loaf of bread, you wouldn't give him a scorpion, how much more will your father in heaven do? That's to the disciples. That's to the guys that we put halos on and carve on the outsides of cathedrals and paint in our murals. So how must it be for the rest of us? But there's another level of evil, and this is the reason why the Bible, kind of like Dante's Inferno, there will be degrees of punishment according to the biblical story. You can choose to reject it and take your chances. Pascal's wager. Have at it. But there are degrees of punishment based on your degree of depravity. So in an extreme instance, um, you know, Hitler will get it worse than a guy who rejected Jesus Christ but lived in some general sense a moral life. That's the biblical argument. But there's another level of evil that goes beyond the general evil that I'm talking about here. It is a settled disposition of evil. It is an attitude of evil. It is an aggressive, I'm going to do as much harm as I can kind of evil. It's the sort of evil that says, I'm utterly indifferent to human suffering. It's interesting, Elie Wiesel, you know, who was a, he was a survivor, he was a Holocaust survivor, survivor of um, Auschwitz. He wrote a little book, a brilliant little book called Night. I would recommend reading it, but in it, he says this, he says, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It's indifference. That's really quite profound. The opposite of love is not hate. It is indifference. We're talking about people who just don't care about you. And in my view, and we will discuss this more with an upcoming documentary on all that I saw south of the border. On previous trips, by the way, this wasn't new. Some of what I encountered, some of what I encountered here was new, but some of it wasn't. It's just that before... I never took video. <laughs> I never, um, I, I'm not a guy who, it's not my habit to do selfies. It's not my habit to, um, to take pictures. It's not my habit to take videos. So I'm having to retrain myself that when I'm in these kind of circumstances to try to do that so that I can show you some of what it is that I'm encountering. But in my view, coming back from what I just saw, and here's the big bomb. If you get nothing else from what I'm telling you, the, Biden administration is running a massive human trafficking op, perhaps the biggest the world has ever seen. At least since the transatlantic trade. African trade, much larger in slavery, probably to this day still is. It's overlooked by the West, but Africans enslaving other Africans and selling them has been going on since time immemorial. But the Biden administration has a massive human trafficking op going on. And I promise you, they don't care about these people. And if I could help you understand something, it is this. Please, if you're a conservative, if you're truly a Christian, do not direct your hate towards these people who are trying to come to the United States. I don't fault them. I would do the same thing. I've been with people in just the last few days who are covered in lice, who have gone through the Darien Gap with nothing, who have been macheted, raped, watched people be eaten by wild beasts, who have done 
some of the most extraordinary things they have suffered, and they just keep going. And it's because they're that desperate. Your anger should be directed towards the Biden administration that has thrown open the borders of the United States and said to them all, come on! Not caring what happens to any of them. The Biden administration does not care. It does not care what happens to these people. They pretend that they do. This is the same old Democrat trope. We act like we're the party of compassion. Ramaswamy recently said in a public speech that, that Democrats have habitually been more compassionate, something to that effect. That's nonsense. They have never been compassionate. They don't care. They pretend to be compassionate about, <laughs> about people the, the way Satan might be. The way he might slither up into the garden and pretend that he really has your best interests in mind while God doesn't. That's demonic people. They know that these people are being trafficked. They know that children are disappearing. They know, and by the way, I can tell you firsthand, more people are dying in the Darien Gap than is being reported. Way more. And it's because the bodies are being hidden. And they're being hidden by the indigenous peoples there who are committing a lot of evil themselves and by the drug traffickers. And that's because they want the human trafficking train to keep rolling. They want to keep rolling through the Darien Gap. And if people walk in and see rotten bodies all over the place, they might turn around. That's not the way they're going to make money. That isn't the way they're going to profit. The Biden administration is every bit as bad as the cartels here. Every bit is bad. I don't make a distinction between guys like Adolf Eichmann, who never actually killed any Jews. He didn't send anyone personally into the gas chambers. What he did was he was highly efficient as a bureaucrat at keeping the trains on time to places like Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Mauthausen and Middlebaugh Dora. That's what he did. He kept the trains rolling on time to those places. I make very little distinction between him and the guy who actually pulled the trigger. They're all part of the same system. They're all evil. Kamala Harris visiting a Planned Parenthood um, uh, um, what I want to say, death factory. People want to make a big deal out of that. I just say, look, she just simply is showing you who they really are and what we've known they are all along. That's what they've been doing. They have been enabling the mass extermination of children. And by the way, particularly black children. Look at where Planned Parenthoods are, mostly in black neighborhoods. It's a genocide. And in the same way, I don't make a big distinction between what the Biden administration is and all the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. and their enablers at, at, at the United Nations, at uh, IOM, the International Organization of Migration, which is a UN organization that is facilitating, I saw them everywhere, south of the border, facilitating um, this movement to our border. I don't make any distinction between any of those bureaucrats and the cartels who are profiting from them, macheteing people, raping people, murdering people. It's both men and women who are being raped, by the way. Children who are disappearing. They're the same. In my book, they're the same. In this case, the Biden administration, they're the Eichmanns. And then we have down here at the bottom, we've got the Otto Malls, um, guy at Auschwitz who, who did a lot of the killing himself. That's what's happening here. That is what is going on. And so the stampede that we see coming across our borders, this is what it is. Now, I've shared with you in previous episodes what the idea is that is driving this. Coming up, we're going to discuss more of what the reality of it is, what it looks like. And again, I've gone to these places. I've gone there because I've sought understanding. I wanted to know for myself. I wanted to see for myself 
what is happening. And I will tell you that part of what you need to know is that almost everybody is lying. There's a lot of good reporting that's been taking place there. But there's also been a lot of lying, a lot of obfuscation about the reality of what is happening south of our border. And right now, <laughs> I'm fired up. I'm tired. I can't imagine what some of these people have been through. Ask yourself when it comes to people like this. There are, there are people on Twitter that have been angry at me because I have said this. That there needs to be a Christian response to these people. Now, I want to be clear that I'm talking about Central and South America most of all. I haven't had any engagement. I mean, I have overseas, but I haven't had any engagement on the immigration side with, say, Somalis and Afghans that are being brought into the United States. They're being flown in for the most part. That's a, that's a different kind of immigration that is going on there. What I'm talking about here specifically in this episode and in the next episode or two relates specifically to Central and South America. And I'm not talking about the criminal element, not talking about the cartels. I'm not talking about the sleeper cells that are coming in to the United States. A lot of these people... There needs to be a Christian response to them because the re fact of the matter is they are coming into the country. Now, you can stamp your feet, you can sulk, you can be angry all you want. Or you can deal with the reality of it. And I think there needs to be a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, we need to have strong border policy. We need to have strong borders. We need to enforce it. We need to enforce We don't need new laws. We just need to enforce existing border and immigration law. That's what we need. But in the meantime, we're dealing with a corrupt criminal administration that is bringing them in. And you're sending the wrong message to these people if you are not seeking to engage with them in a thoughtful way. Because if you aren't, I'm going to warn you that your organization, your church, your business is going to cease to exist as you know it if you don't have a plan. And you need to ask yourself this, do these people have a soul? Do they have a soul? Now, I will say this to some, and on Twitter, they'll get angry with me and say, these people are all criminals. They shouldn't come in here. I get it. You're not listening to what I'm telling you. I'm telling you they are coming in. So that's the reality that you have to deal with for the time being until such time as there's a change of administration, laws are enforced, and people are deported. Until that happens, and we don't know that it will ever happen, you are faced with the reality of these People coming into the country. What are you going to do about it? Just bitch about it? Just whine? Are you going to respond to these people like they have souls? Like they matter? Like they are human beings? And like, by the way, they are people who are fleeing some of the same things that you and I hate. I do not fault so many of these people that I've talked to, and I've talked to loads of them, and before you begin to lecture me on what my attitude should be about this, you need to have done the same. You need to have seen what I've seen. You need to have engaged what I've engaged. When I'm talking to a man who tells me, and by the way, these are the stories that you hear all over the place, that he can no longer feed his family, that the government was so corrupt they shut down his business, that they're indoctrinating his children, and that he decided he had to flee the country, no wall could prevent me from coming into the United States if I thought there was a better life for my children, for my family to be had there. And I would hope that someone would treat me with kindness. I would hope that someone would. So again, we have to deal with this at a policy level and at a humanitarian, Christian level, both. And if your response is just to dump out hate on these people... I don't want you on my team. I don't want you on my team. So that's not a Christian response. The two things can be true at the same time here, that we need to enforce existing border and immigration law, and we need to have a, uh, a, uh, a Christian response to this issue. Both things can be true at the same time. So, 
We've talked about this from an idea level. We will now talk about it from a reality level. Where is America going? What can we do? And I hope to offer you some kind of response to that in um, upcoming episodes. This has been Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton.